fruits of the Spirit. We know the fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, self-control. But none of those can exist without the other unspoken component. And it's something you groan to see in your people. It's a demonstration of faith. It's called trust. And you just brought another word through another sister that confirms the word that just came through my beloved. And this is the other word that was received. Just a, God, I know we, we know what you're looking for. We're going to hear it again right now. Because you believe in me and trust my word and my power, you will see great and mighty things. Those who trust in the Lord will be made safe. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't rely on your understanding. In all these ways and times, we acknowledge you and you will direct our path. And the Lord goes on to say through the prophecy, I will glorify my name and you will praise me. He's going to give us reasons to praise him, brothers and sisters. You won't have to go looking for anything. He, you will have reasons to be inspired to praise Him in Kroger's, to praise Him in Walmart, whether there's toilet paper there or not. Amen. Little levity does us some good. Amen. Father, Your joy is our strength, and You're looking for a people whose heart is inclined towards You and trusts You, trusts that Your Word is true. Not just a faith, but a faith so strong that we know that God is our confidence. That's where trust, that's where faith is, gets really white hot. Is where I, just, I don't just believe, I know. I fully place my confidence and my trust in God. Will you do that? Will you listen to the word spoken and sung? I believe God's talking to us, that he's wanting us, our response to be to difficult and troublesome times is just to make him our ark. Our ark. The Lord is our ark. Amen. Stay in the boat. Okay. Now I'm going to try to preach something and see what happens. Father God, open up the word to us, to our understanding. If ever there was a time we need to get saturated with the oil of your anointing, it's times such as these. And may we have a teachable, open spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Jackie, you weren't here earlier, but I spoke with him about Amanda. And what a, everybody applauded for the example of faith that she is. So convey that to her for us. Because uh, Jackie's in contact with her. It's the phone connection is difficult out there, uh, as you might imagine. So, Yes, Lord. Well, I'm glad you're here today. I really, really am. And I hope that you read the little notices coming in the door, and we're going to continue to try to uh, be cognizant of everybody's hygiene. The children are released to go and enjoy Jesus, and we've got a lot of newcomer children, and you're going to have a great time. Uh, so there's, there you go, there's wa those waiting for you back there. Now, if you're a, if you're a tween, if you're a preteen, and, and they want to stay in here, that's fine. They can stay with us. That would be great. And uh, I think there will be something for everybody. Praise the Lord. Now, this word that you heard me mention, saturated, saturated. It's a message title today. It's get saturated. And uh, I practiced up on a little skit before church this morning. And I'm going to make a fool out of myself. Is the has the pastor ever made a fool out of himself here before? Is, am I plowing a new road here? Is this old news? Okay. Okay, how many ever watch, ever watch Spongebob on TV? How many want to confess your sins? <laughs> how many ever watch, hold them up high. There's, there's, there's strength in numbers. Everybody, every, all you who've watched Spongebob at least once. Oh, we need to have an altar call right now. I think it's one of the biggest problems with my daughter, you know. But, you know, Spongebob is saturated with the wrong stuff. He's saturated with the wrong stuff, man. But, but, you know, it's, it's in a sponge's nature to be saturated, you know. 
and you know they're a creature of the ocean and they live in a hydrated saturated atmosphere but you take you know some of us we, we wash di- some of us men even wash dishes what virtuous men you are if you wash dishes <laughs> but anyway as rarely as i do but uh typically we have a yellow sponge on our sink top and and, and uh uh, you know, the, the, al- the house we used to live in the new one. And uh, so if you could all just imagine a sponge that's just stayed too long out from underneath the faucet, out from, under, from being in the sink. And it, you, you can see it in your mind what happens. You know, it's first the sponge is looking real good. It's just gets laid up there and, ah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And after a while, just kind of... I'm going to start... <laughs> that's as far as I'm going to go with my skit. That was really hard, wasn't it? Are you proud of me? Come on, give me a hand of clap. Man. But I mean, I could do the whole thing on the floor and curl up, you know, but, you know, it's, it's not the, the normal state of affairs for a sponge to be on the sink top of life. It's meant to be down under the faucet of the Father, under the faucet of God's goodness and blessing and provision. But there's something about us where we kind of lay there for a while and we almost kind of get used to that reality of laying on the side and we see things come and go and we know the the sinks right there we even see the water but we kind of just stay out of the stream of it can i get a witness we know that it's there yeah anytime i want to get under it i can well why would we ever want to just coexist with all that blessing why not get under that blessing why do people just want to sit there and just rubberneck yeah i see people over there praising the lord i see people over there having a god time and blah 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 and and they're, they're all soaked up with something, you know, and, I, and I'm sure it's good because they seem to be pretty happy about it. And it's reassuring to me to see that everybody else is having a good time while we're sitting there going. I don't understand that, do you? Well, I mean, why do we want to be like that when we can <sighs> be true to the nature God gave you the day you got saved? The day you got saved, your spirit was made alive. And when your spirit, you're supposed to be like a duck in the pond, man. You're supposed to be just in there. You know, I don't know if the duck analogy is a very good analogy, but anyway. But we should be deep, deep sea divers going out the deep end in all of this. Amen? That's the nature of what it means to be a Christian, is to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's your spirit made alive to enjoy and get under the faucet. He said, out of your belly. Should, you know what's neat about being a real Christian is you got a faucet on the inside and a faucet on the outside. you got faucets everywhere. You're just a leaky mess, man. That's how it's supposed to be. He says, out of your belly shall so, so livers of living water. And he says, come upon you like that mantle that came upon the prophets. So he's coming up in you and coming on you, man. I'm telling you what, if that don't get you saturated, honey, I don't know what's going to. But that's what the Christian life is supposed to be. And, and any time we endeavor to try to live without that yielded spirit, things begin to atrophy. Things begin to dry up. And then you become a valley of dry bones. And it's not a very inspiring thing to see. I'm always inspired by people who love the Lord, love their brothers and sisters, are prayed up. They're not perfect. They'd be the first to tell you. But they know where the blessing is, and they're smart enough to keep getting blessings to keep staying soaked up and saturated in the spirit. Amen? It's just ducky when you live like this. And I'm not a quack. All right, we better just stop right now. We just better stop the duck stuff right here. If it walks like a duck, talk now and just stop, stop. Stop, stop Randy, stop, Randy. Okay, okay. <laughs> Father, may we have joy and seriousness in equal measure today because a spoonful of joy helps the medicine go down god you did not call us to dryness and tradition and religion and vain repetitions and familiarity and same old and all that stuff we get into where the devil steals away the joy and the vitality and the effervescence of being a christian we refuse lord god to have the joy of the lord stolen from us lord kick us off the edge of the counter kick us off the edge of that sink and down into that sink of your spirit lord Oh, and just made that faucet just pour upon us today, Lord. Because then when we're like that, when we're filled with your glory and your goodness, you might even give us a little bit of soap to wash off some dirty souls. You might, e- you might even just anoint us and equip us, Lord, to help rescue people who definitely need a touch from you. But we can't do it when we're dry, old, crusty sponges. We need your anointing more than ever. Show us how to have it in Jesus' name.
Did you know that the Bible says that you could be filled with all the fullness of God? Imagine what you would look like. Come on now. Imagine what, make it personal. Imagine what you would look like. Listen to me, some of you are caught up in so much low self-esteem and insecurities. You've lost your love for your fellow man. Some Christians in this room. Listen to me, don't anybody tune me out now. This is for you. If we were to allow the full measure of God take up residence in us, where is there room for insecurities, for bitterness, for unforgiveness, for lusts and materialism and worldliness? If we say, God, I'd rather have you than all of that mess, what would happen to you? I'm talking to you. Make it as if you and I are only the one having a conversation. God's listening in. What would that be like if you truly allowed all the fullness of God to saturate you? God, I know there's stuff that's messed up in me, and nature abhors a vacuum. I want to decrease. I want you to increase. Right now, Lord, I'm taking a position that I don't want any of me to live in the next five seconds. In the next five seconds, I'm just saying, category, I'm laying it all down. I, wanna just be, I just want to be dead to myself, and I want to be filled with all your goodness. Cause in, can anybody find anything wrong with that? Can anybody take exception to a Christian doing that? I just want to totally empty myself so I can have all that you are. Is there anybody to think that's a sinful prayer? How many of all think that's a good thing? Then why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you doing that? Some of you. It's our choice to be full of ourselves. Oops. Didn't mean to offend anybody. To be full of ourselves. Have you ever run up on a Christian like that? I'm not asking you to name names. Have anybody run up on a Christian? It seems like the whole topic of conversation is their agenda in their world. Am I, can I get a witness? Or full of him. Ephesians 3.19, what does it say? What does your Bible say in Ephesians 3.19? Not mine, yours. Paul prayed that you would know the love of Christ which passes your human understanding to the point that you're filled with all the fullness of God. My friends, if you prayed for that, believed your Bible, didn't just read and go, that's nice prose and poetry. How wonderful that must have been way back then. No, no, no. How wonderful it would be for you right here and now because it's for you. The, Paul, Peter said, repent that times of refreshing may come to you and your children and all those who are far off to as many as the Lord will call. These things are still true to you today. Don't let any devil, any ideology steal it from you. You in this room today can choose to be filled with all the fullness of God. And when that happens, it displaces the low self-esteem, this isolation, the repetitions, the old thought, everything that has got you in lockdown from the goodness and the joy and the grace of God. Isn't it about time that you said, enough is enough. I want all that God has for me. Devil, hit the road in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood over me. I plead the goodness and the promises of God over me. Lord, you paid too great a price for me to sit on my blessed assurance one more day and not have all that you want me to have. Oh, I don't know where this is coming from. All I know is I'm about ready to run to the altar right now. Anybody want to join me? Who's my own worst enemy? Oh, yeah, you're right, Lord, I am. Who's your own worst enemy? Are you being an enemy to yourself right now? Are you listening with your spirit? Are you analyzing the word with your mind that you're receiving right now? Are you listening with your spirit? Or do you, is your flesh all dandered up? Is your mind trying to analyze every word that this flawed preacher is speaking? The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they received it with total openness and teachableness. God has a blessing for you today. There's already been several blessings he's poured out of this flawed vessel already if you had ears to hear him. There's more coming. Don't deny yourself a blessing. Especially in a season like this. God, God saw to it you persevered to be here because he wants to deposit a cornucopia of blessings and reassurance and promises. Don't do yourself a disservice by just staying in the outer courts today. Today is an important strategic day. Receive what you need from the Lord to be filled with his presence, to get saturated with reassurance and guidance and provision. If you want that, say, so be it, Lord. We've been learning in previous weeks about distinguishing between our soul and our spirit. First Thessalonians 5.23, I hope by now 
you're in total agreement that you're made in the image of God, that you have a body. If you have a body, raise the hand of that body. And if you believe that you have a unique personality, unlike the person next to you, raise the other hand. All right? That's pretty good. Stick them up, right? But then you've also got the most noble part of yourself that you can't see that hand go up because it's, a, it's your spirit that was made alive and born again through what Jesus did for you. And yes, that spirit also sinned. The, the, the Bible talks about the conscience being, being seared and the, and the conscience you're the blood of Jesus cleansing you from your conscience, of the conscience. So what I'm trying to say is you have a spirit, soul, and body. It's, pr- it's obvious in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. The most important part is your spirit because as you've heard me say in a variety of ways, when your spirit fully gets saturated with the presence of God, it conveys that blessing to your personality, to your thought processes, to your experiences, to your decisions. Your emotions become more healthy and your decisions become more in line with God's will. Does this make sense? But everything suffers if you're not a deep worshiper, a one who learns how to get past any kind of hindrance. I said any kind of shackle, any kind of control issues, any kind of bad theology or bad experiences with, the, with charismatics or Pentecost. You get past all. You refuse to let anything hinder you from going into the Holy of Holies and your spirit genuinely says, Holy Spirit, I want all that you have for me. I'm going to rip off all apprehensions and insecurities. I just want to worship you, as the Bible says, in spirit, with my spirit and in truth and in that context believe with me because it's biblical he can saturate your spirit with his presence and his glory so reassuring so satisfying and then you take that and your soul learns to trust that not reject it not to quench the spirit but you're worshiping in spirit and truth and then your mind begins to accept listen to me the thoughts of christ Wow, the thoughts of Christ conveyed to you as you allow the way God thinks and the way the kingdom operates to come into you. And now you're an extension of the kingdom on earth and you begin to walk out the vision statement of Grace Church where you are literally the hem of Jesus' garment 2020 on the streets of our communities. Does that not sound cool? It won't happen unless we know what it means to get our spirit saturated. And so this is the third week, the third installment on this message, approaching it from a variety, if you've been hearing an echo, you've been hearing one, from a variety of different directions, God appealing to you to be a true worshiper in spirit. You're not being uh, cajoled or strong-armed into becoming a Pentecostal or a charismatic or a chandelier. No, you're being encouraged to be filled with all the fullness of God. Because you already agreed that that's something that you can have. Irrespective of the do- denomination and anything else you've experienced. Can anybody, everybody agree there's a real Holy Ghost? Yeah. And he wants you. <laughs> you see that Uncle Sam? Remember those old posters? Does Jesus want you? Does the Father want you? Does the Holy Spirit want you? Why not have all three? You're going to be with him for eternity. Wouldn't it be a good idea to get acquainted? And some of us, th- I was an evangelist. And i got to tell you, one of the greatest ironies for me is ministering in spirit-filled churches where most of them weren't spirit-filled. <laughs> huh? Took me a while to, what's going on here, Lord? Is just keep going. Just keep giving them, just keep offering the opportunity. Keep all, I love them. I'm not going to strong arm them to fall in love with me. I wish every one of them loved me. Every man and woman would just love me. That's why I gave them that commandment to love them with all my, love me with all their hearts. But I can't force it. It's got to be something they want to do. But Lord, how do you tolerate the hardness of heart and the holding back and the fears and all that? How do you tolerate that? Because I'm a long-suffering God and I love them and I just keep hoping that they, and believing and working on them and the goodness of God leading them to repentance so that they finally one day come to a place they forget about themselves and concentrate on me and worship me. I thought that's what you're going to say, God. God wants us to be a spiritual people, but we've got to have a saturated spirit to be a spiritual people. It all comes back to accepting his fullness. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 2.
Just read along with me, verses 11 through 16. What man in this room, or woman, knows the things inside of them except that spirit of who's inside of you right now? So your spirit knows what kind of condition your soul's in. That's why you're so unhappy. Because <laughs> your spirit and your soul are not doing well together. What man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man who is in him? And in that, in that regard, no one knows the things of God in the same way except the spirit of God. See, God has a spirit, the Holy Spirit, and he knows everything about God. You have a spirit and it knows everything about you. And sometimes it doesn't like the way it's like to live in there with obsessions and addictions and habitual habit, things that just grieve that spirit in you that was made alive the day you got saved. It's sad. Now have we received, as Christians, it's speaking to everyone here in this room, say, not the spirit of this world, but the capital S spirit who is from God. What was the reason for that? Well, he wants you to know the things that have been freely given to you. Do you know what those things are? Or are you still in the outer courts? See, God, there's ain't too much of a price paid for us to live like paupers anymore. Man, you know, we're king's kids, y'all. These things we speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual matters with spiritual matters. But look at this. The natural man receives the things... The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Now, can a Christian have a natural man kind of mindset? Can a person be a Christian, but they're still looking and equating and evaluating things on the base of their mental acuity rather than the Spirit of God giving them dis discernment? See, the natural man is defaulted back to just looking at things and processing it and running it through with his little, you know, bing bong, <laughs> our little computers. What a mess my computer is. I don't trust my computer at all. Any of y'all trust your computer anymore? The natural man doesn't receive that stuff. You'll come into church and you hear, I bet you've come in here sometimes and just heard things, go, man, I don't know what that means, but praise God, let's go have lunch after church. Oh, it's quiet in here again. It sounded kind of good. I, I vaguely was aware of some, some stuff happening. A few of the things made sense, but most of it was just kind of, I don't know what it was, but anyway, let's go have some fellowship at the at the steakhouse. See, that means you're in a natural mind mindset. Can I just be honest with you? Because there's plenty here in the spirit. If the, I, I, I can tell those of you who've got your antennas up and those of you being polite. Yeah, praise God. Uh -huh. Man, I don't want you all to miss out. Man, when you love people, you want them to fare sumptuously. You want them to, and I want every one of us to have filet mignon together. Is that all right? Someone paid for it already. It's already paid for. Let's just go ahead and party, man. But we've got to choose to come to the party. We've got to choose. The natural man doesn't receive it. It's foolish. Might not say it out loud. Boy, that sermon was foolish. Uh, don't worry about offending me, by the way. Mm -mm, I'm past that now. I just, I just want to open up and let God speak. And uh, if you reject him, that's on you. Ouch. Ouch. But if you receive him, that's on you, too. And that's the kind of on you you want. Amen? He who is spiritual, oh, the natural man doesn't receive their foolishness, nor can he know them because they have to be discerned by your spirit. Everybody say, discerned by my spirit. Say it again, discerned by my spirit. Your spirit needs to be protecting and guiding your, your personality and your soul and your memories. You don't allow your spirit to do that job. No wonder you have a strongholds and things to deal with. He who is spiritual evaluates everything, yet he himself is not evaluated by anyone. Why? Because when you walk in that kind of spiritual uprightness, your life cleans up and there's not a whole lot to judge anymore. And you know people like that in this room. They're walking in the light, and as they do, they, they dispense with stupidity and ignorance and willfulness and rebellion and lust and carnality, and God is just working with them, and they're just incrementally becoming more like Jesus and you come along I'm going to see if I can pick them apart <laughs> I'm going to get her I'm going to find something bad about her well maybe there's something over on this side man you know, I can't find nothing really to be upset about they're judged by no one because they're walking in the spirit already see how it works see what this means huh 
For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? And then it says, but I have the mind of Christ. How's that working for you? Are you thinking like him yet? Am I thinking like him yet? Well, not 100%. But does this Bible say that hypothetically there's a way and a means whereby we can think the thoughts of Jesus? Don't you want some of that? And it's through being saturated. The mind of Christ is imparted because the what things know the things of God except the, what did it say earlier? The Spirit of God knows the things of God. You understand what this is saying? The Spirit of God knows the things. He knows the mind of Christ. And when you yield your spirit to the Holy Spirit, guess who you start thinking like? Man, I want all of this. I'm about ready to just run around here and jump over. I want all that God has for me. Do you? I'm just speaking the word, man. If I'm a, this is the way that Christ's thoughts are deposited. See, it's a positional statement. That means it's there for you. That's the position God has taken to make the mind of Christ accessible to you. That's God's position. But the experience of it will not be known by you unless you are proactive about yielding your spirit to God so that you can think the way God thinks. You follow me? It's there for you. But you have to pursue it. You have to chase it down. So we allow the Holy Spirit Let's just say this one more time. I want to make sure I don't leave anybody in the deep weeds. I allow the Holy Spirit to fully saturate my spirit, which my soul chooses to trust. There's that trust word again. And so I yield and receive the graces of God and the mind of Christ that transforms me to think and act like Jesus. Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That means metamorphosis. That's the Greek word. Don't be conformed to this world, Christian, but be transformed by the renewing of your soul, your mind, will, and emotions, so that you may prove, that is to say, validate and give evidence to the will of God. So when we allow ourselves to be filled with the Spirit, there's that impartation where our spirits inform our souls, transforms our personality, our bad experiences. We do learn to process all the stuff we've gone through under the cross. We bring everything captive to the obedience of Christ. It affects the way that we think, act, reason, decide, relate, advance. And people see you being transformed, and it gives glory to God because where did she go? She's a different person. Where did he go? Some, something better is in that guy, and I want some of it. That's called giving glory to God. How many of y'all want to give glory to God? So it's not just about us being happier and having our best life now. It's us being positioned to do what Jesus said, to be poured out. Son of Man didn't come to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you want to give your life as a ransom for others? Is that a Jesus thing to do? then we need the anointing of God to fulfill the calling of God in our lives. That's the essentials of the whole deal right there. Romans 12, 2 is a powerful verse to memorize. I would encourage you to do that because it will help you to see how this whole process works. You choose, to, you choose conformity or transformation. Just to conform to church as usual. Many people do it. They still go to heaven. Don't have a lot to show for it when they, go th when they get there. Because churchianity doesn't save you. Christianity saves you. Churchianity doesn't give you rewards in heaven. Christianity, it's relationship, not a religion. Many will say, Lord, Lord, and they say, I'd depart from you. I never knew you. We didn't have a love affair. We didn't have a love relationship. Things were done out of a constraint or a desire for accolades and recognition of man. He knows what our motives are. And when we do things out of love and unity and communion, one spirit, then everything matters from the smallest little gesture we do to the big, everything counts because, it's, uh, because we love him. All right. So I've already mentioned this, the uh, notes here I'm looking at. We can choose to just dabble. We can go to the spirit-filled churches of America and do like I've seen as an evangelist and just dabble and have a little, ah, 
little spritz, you know, glory. I got enough to carry me for a week. I don't know what that is. P- p- there are many people in, Christi- in spiritual churches that chase after experiences rather than experiencing the one who, who gave them that, that joy. They become more focused on the blessing than the blessor. And God's jealous for you to love him and obey. Amen. And so a lot of people in spiritual churches, they dabble. They don't want to get drenched. They just want to dabble. They want to wade around, but they don't want to dive in. But fullness requires being saturated. Otherwise, obedience to the will of God will never happen. And the prayer that God taught us will never be realized in our lives. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And many around you in this room have experienced, this is not a new word to a number of people in this room, it's just confirmation. But many of this room have experienced the joy found in being filled with God's Spirit and then serving Him as an overflow of that. Not serving Him to get. It's not performance-based acceptance. Many people psychologically, even in the church, they do things to validate themselves, feel worthy. Martha, the Marthy thing, just running around doing stuff, thinking that a flurry of activity will make them feel better about themselves, and that's what God wants. No, it's it's not about us feeling better. It's about us bringing joy and obedience to the heart of God, and then we feel better. We do what He's called us to do, not what we feel we must do. It starts with Him. It doesn't start with us. Can I get a witness in here? I must be about my Father's business, someone said. Who was that again? (gasps) Oh, Jesus. He must be about His business. And sometimes He just says, Kneel before me and savor me, he says to Mary. And she chose that one little thing. Saturation. So much good comes out of that. Here's some saturators before my time runs out. My time is very short. I'm going to have to blitz through these. Would you please take a few notes and revisit these? There's some scriptures attached to these. Some of them are real no-brainers, but I'm going to go through them because I found these things put me in a position very quickly to receive from the Holy Spirit into my spirit. And the very first one at the top of the list, without fail, is this. It's very profound, very unusual. Are you ready? Repent. (laughs) And you've got to pent before you repent, by the way, man. But basically, just make sure there's no sin between you and God. Why bother filling the air with a bunch of my noise and and, and air coming across my vocal cords? If if I've got sin in my heart, he ain't going to hear a thing that I say when I approach him. It's a wasted effort. So it makes sense right out of the gate. We need to make sure there's no unaddressed sin in our lives. And for the life of me, why Christians come to the altars of their church and ask for blessing and give me this and give me that. And God's got them under conviction long before they ever came into this room and they still haven't dealt with it, but they're wanting God to validate their lives with blessings and increase in favor when they haven't dealt with the sin in their lives. Is there something wrong here? Did you come in today with stuff you need to repent of? Do yourself a favor, man. Give it up now. Don't wait for any altar call. Make your chair your altar. And do it before you come here. My goodness, in your position to hear every little word spoken. There's nothing to break your communion and to hear God's word clearly. Don't waste another moment in this service. There's still time. Get the sin out of the way. Repent right now so you can hear the other saturators I'm about to share with you. But if we regard sin in our heart, the Lord won't hear us. Acts 3.19 says, Repent that times of refreshing may come. Listen to me. Repent that times of refreshing may come. It's not refreshing come and then I'll repent. It's God, I just defy you to make me feel this blessing everybody talks about and then I'll repent. No. Repent so that God would be pleased to pour out his favor and blessing upon you. This is the first, basically the first sermon of Peter. Get the sin out of the way. God sees that you're earnest, and then he will pour out the Holy Spirit, saturate you. James, or excuse me, Acts 3.19. Secondly, renounce all demonic interferences. Oh, pastor, you're not talking to me because I'm a Christian. That must mean someone else. No. No, 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 no. Listen to me. The Bible says, give no occasion to the enemy. It was addressed to Christians. Give no opportunity to the devil. Now, if the Bible's admonishing to do that, that means he takes opportunities where you give it to him. 
Now, there's many, many Christians that are demonized, and some are in this room today. And the enemy is interfering with you even hearing this message. Demons of distraction, preoccupation, obsession, tradition, ritual. Oh, the devil loves to go to church, honey. And he'll carry a Bible when he comes, and he knows it well. So let's say you've dealt with your sin as best you know it, but you still got the residue, the oily, greasy, grungy spirits of darkness and familiarity that are still sticking to you like glue and they're clinging to your ankles. And the moment you have an unguarded when you sit down, you think you've confessed your sins, but then they start crawling up your spine saying, oh, you don't believe that though now, do you? Boy, they're saying something weird at that church. Boy, you better protect yourself. That's, that's, that's evil right there. They'll even, the devil will even try to tell you that something's evil. Is he seemingly working against himself? No, he's afraid of you coming into the truth. He fears you coming into the truth. So you may have confessed your sins. That doesn't mean your attachments are dealt with yet. Remove all demonic interferences. That's why Paul said to Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sign mind. And I've done countless polls in churches I've ministered in as a speaker, as a singer. How many of you, it's amazing. I won't do it today. I say, how many people are struggling with fear, a fear that's not from the Lord? And the majority, every time, in every church I've ever been to, raise their hands. I'm thinking to myself, why is this? How can this be? Because a mature love casts out fear. There's a lot of unfinished business in the camp of God. Come on now. And has, a lot of it has to do with us, you know, tippy-toeing around demons, accommodating the demons. We don't want to hurt the demons. We don't want to offend them. Excuse me? Luke 10, 19. I have given you power to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the authority. And nothing shall by any means... Now, did Jesus give you authority for you to sit there and make sure the demons are comfortable today? Is that what authority is for? Is authority for us to be a host to demons? No. I've given you authority to host demons. Can I do anything else for you, spirit of fear? Can I pamper you some more? Would you, can I fluff your pillow? What is going on with us? Well, the devil knows we're creatures of habit. Sometimes we'd rather make a fear or a, some kind of sin comfortable then try to address it, because that's real upsetting, and that's real unfamiliar, and that might, might affect my whole chemistry and the whole way I live. Notice the me, my, me, my, I. And yet God has gone through great, great effort to help us get set free from all demonic of interferences. How can we be filled with the Spirit if we let all these attachments shackle us down? You need to renounce, you need to repent of sin, renounce all demonic attachments and interferences, every soul tie, any stronghold, anything that exhausts itself against the knowledge of God, that's your responsibility, not this pastor. I've got enough to deal with with myself. Thank you very much. I appreciate the offer, though. <laughs> <sighs> Number three, tell God you're thirsty. Be an honest SpongeBob. Lord, truth be known, I'm feeling kind of dry right now. I haven't had much to give anybody. I'm not very inspiring. I haven't been sharing my faith much. I don't even really feel like I want to. I see people suffering, even this tornado thing. feel bad for them. glad it wasn't me, but that's about as far as the, the compassion goes. Ah, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe that's a sign. Lord, I, I don't think I should be reacting that way, thinking that way. It's not, it doesn't resonate with the scriptures and how you live. God, I, um, I don't think you like me like that. And he's saying, correct a mundo. You want something more? Well, I'm going to get back to you on that. And then you get, hopefully you get to a point where you're so desperate, and I hope it's today that you go, you know, God, in my spirit, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really a dry, worthless, crinkled up, shriveled sponge on the sink top of your will. I am sorry. So you repent of your sin. You refuse every demonic attachment. You admit to God, because he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Those are the ones going to be filled. You've got to become clean with honor and say, Lord, my spirit is shriveled up. It's not getting anywhere. All this being a cynic and skeptic and analytical and sitting there watching other people have a blessing while I sit there and try to evaluate it every Sunday. This is stupid on wheels. 
I, I, I'm not very inspirational. I'm not very, very fruitful. I need your spirit. I want to be filled with the fullness of God. I don't know what that looks like, walks like, talks like, but I trust you. There's that trust word. I trust you. I trust Jesus for my salvation. Why can't I trust the Holy Spirit for my empowerment? Oh, did you hear that? I trust Jesus for my salvation. Why can't I trust the Holy Spirit to empower me to live the Christ life? Which is what Christian means. I got to move on. Believe what he says, written or spoken. Believe what he says, whether written or spoken. Romans ten seventeen says, Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're familiar with that, right? Did you know that where it says word in that scripture, it doesn't mean this right here. It doesn't mean the Bible. It means what God says to advance the Bible. It's the specific instruction God gives you for the Bible to be spelled out personally. So your faith advances. God's will is advanced through you as you listen to the Lord, I guess you could say unpack or break open what his word is saying to you in some specific context in your ministry, in your relationships. Call Sarah and let her know you heard about her loss and you're praying for her. Oh, but then if I do that, I can't finish making a macaroni and cheese for my kids. But the Lord says, call Sarah. Because you know the Bible says to serve others. And the kids will be fed, no problem. But the Lord's saying, see, what, what he's doing is he's taking a scripture that says serve others, and he's showing you how it specifically applies by calling some gal named Sarah. Are you with me? Now, is it in the Bible, does it in the Bible say go call Sarah right now? Is that in the Bible? No. But is it in the Bible? Because if God is asking you to give, carry out a principle in the word about being a servant, and that principle is advanced with a rhema, a prophetic, Philip, go down that road and talk to that guy in that chariot over there, or Chevrolet, same difference. You obey that, and it's an extension of God's word. Are you with me? But I will tell you this, that you don't really learn to hear those specific marching orders with confidence until you learn to hear the written word and obey it and get the principles into you first. All right? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Everybody say the whole counsel. Everywhere that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I got in my hands here a document that Gloria handed out a while back. And I love this collection that she lovingly prepared because it basically takes a lot of first-person scriptures that allow you to have the mind of Christ. It, it, this is an indication of how you can have the mind of Christ because would Christ ever be in disagreement with his written word? So isn't that not a collection of what? The thoughts of Christ, right? And there's some in there that are super emeralds, rubies, diamonds, and precious stones of the thoughts process of Jesus. I can't read them all, but th this is a bunch of two-sided pages here. And some of you will I'm just going to sh share a couple of them because time is, is escaping us real, real quickly here. But do you remember this one? I'm a new creation in Christ. All things are passed away. All things have become new. If you choose to believe that, then you don't live on the basis of what you have experienced. You live on the basis of what God now says is true. And how many of us are still making decisions based on past experience? See what I'm saying? We have to rewire. I have the mind of Christ. Uh, I have been crucified with Christ, and I'm now seated in heavenly places. Uh, let's see. We're in Laverne, Tennessee, Stones River Road, Old Nashville Highway. Where are we seated right now? Oh, you guys, I couldn't fool you, darn it. Our bodies are here, but the Bible says our spirits are already raised. That'll really mess with your reality when you're at, in any place you find yourself from Monday to Saturday, and you choose to remember in this, in this difficult moment, in this trying circumstance, with this relationship, in this need, but I'm seated in heavenly places right now. While all this stuff is going on around here and here, I'm in an elevated position. I can look down at it from God's perspective and address it accordingly. Isn't that fascinating? But if we don't think like this, we're just kind of living from urgency to urgency, panic to panic, frustration, insecurity, all that stuff. We're one of those, what do you call them, Christians? There's a plethora of incredible promises 
And the Bible says, whereby are given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these we can be partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? You get to have the mind of Christ. Without the scripture written and spoken, you don't know when the mind of Christ is appealing to you. You have to have a context to know when Jesus is talking. The more you know this word written, the more you hear it spoken, and the more you walk it out and you instantly obey without questioning what he says to do. Jesus was wired that way. You want to know how Jesus lived and breathed? You actually get to think and act. This is awesome. This is beyond sci-fi. I can walk through my day tomorrow and actually feel the vibe of being Jesus. Someone go, do 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 Because if, if, it's, if I'm in him and I live and move and I have my being, then who's touching through my hands, Vernon? Huh? Who's looking through my eyes, brother? How much gooder can it get? It, does this sound exotic or weird or totally new? You know what's crazy? Yeah, it does for some because we haven't been living it yet. But even if you're living it, it should still sound exciting and vibrant and thrilling. Wow, you get to think like he did. And it's all through a saturated spirit a teachable spirit, a yielded spirit that takes worship very seriously. Before the first song is sung in here, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if you come dancing in the aisle to me. I mean, I got so much, I don't know what to do, man. Pretty soon we're not going to have enough, we've got to get rid of the chairs so we can just hallelujah and tehillah and barak and do all these things that the Jews of old did and just forget ourselves. Wouldn't hurt my feelings at all if you guys start to cut the rug in a holy dance. That's okay when it's born of the. Okay, I, gotta, I just got to read the other ones. You're going to have to write the scriptures down. We got to get, get going. So you believe what he says to you, written and spoken. I've got four more, and I cannot even break them open. I just got to give you the list. Sorry. <sighs> I wish we could have church till 6 o'clock, but you'd probably never let me preach again. Raise your hands to him and surrender. First Timothy 2 8. I pray that men everywhere lift up holy hands without wrath and guile. I will just say to you, how often do you raise your hands? Why don't you? Is there really any good reason not to? Is he wanting to see you believe that he's actually there? Is he wanting to see that you that you see? Do you sense that he wants you to have faith, that you believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of you as you extend your faith, not just your hands? Because it's not just your hands you're extending, it's your faith you're extending. Raise your hands. Six, let your spirit go. That's probably the biggest one in the whole list, and I have no time to talk about other than to say this. He's a gentleman. He will never call earth you, but he is jealous for you, and every day of your life he wants you to yield every moment of your life he wants you to commune with him and just let your spirit go (coughs) control issues are killing you the Lord is saying right now to you control issues and you are killing me and there's a lot of ways you control just choosing to ignore that moment that word Think about something else. Press, suppress. Run out of the room. Just do anything to avoid this thing of becoming one spirit with God. He's saying, let your spirit go. You cannot worship me without your spirit being released. I am a spirit. If you're going to worship me, your spirit has to worship me. And then he says, or expect nothing ouch I just wrote down what he told me he said to say it if you're not worshiping him in spirit expect nothing no matter how beautiful the music is how wonderful the melody how emotional it feels expect nothing he knows when our spirit is yielded or quenched surrendered or controlled 
He loves you. He's waiting on you to yield it. That's all I can say. In that context, number seven, choose to totally join with him in full trust. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he or she that is joined to the Lord is one spirit in him. So it's one thing to worship. It's another thing to go. And Lord, in this worship, I just, I, I 100%, I just want to be all yours, all in. I, I, I draw near to you, and I ask you to draw near to me. I want that fullness. I just want to forget I'm even on earth anymore, because I'm not. I'm seated in heavenly places, and I just want to own that right now with you, God. I want to draw near to you. I want to be, I don't just want to worship in the outer courts. I want to be one spirit with you. You might just find yourself standing there until 2 o'clock, and we'll leave the doors open for you. Fine with me. Seriously. And we've had that happen. We've had that happen. Glorious. Last one. For those of you who are, have had this experience, great. For those of you who haven't, I hope you get real thirsty for it. The shortest book in the Bible is Jude. It's two of the most dynamic verses in the whole Bible. And you may want to look at it. I hope you've been writing down some of these verses. But just before Revelation, there's a little book called Jude. And it says in verse 20 and 21, as I conclude, But you, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit and keep yourself in the love of God. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit and keep yourself in that, you, that saturation. Keep yourself. He that speaks in his prayer language edifies himself. What does that mean? You're, you're getting so drenched and so saturated to overflowing that you've got plenty to inspire yourself and to bless others. And God, it's never, it's never been about just us. For Paul, it was not about him. He says, we don't preach ourselves, but Jesus, and we're your servants for his sake. And, and, and Paul was just filled with the glory of God. And he said that. God had to bring him to that place of being a selfless servant. At first, he was all about his own ambitions, but here at the end of his life, he says, we don't preach ourselves, but Jesus, and we're your servants for his sake. But when you pray in the Spirit, there's a lot of scriptures that address the fact that and we're talking about not talking about the one where you pray in a tongue in the church and interpret it as Gloria did. That's another wonderful function of the Holy Spirit. But the predominant function is where your spirit is released to talk to God. Everybody say, talk to God. Talk to God. How many have trouble talking to God sometimes? Come on, hold them up. You just don't know how the words to pray that you would like to pray. And you feel like the heavens are brass. That's exactly where your prayer language kicks in. When you pray, when you just have that impasse, that log in, you pray in the spirit and you break past all that and you commune with God no matter how difficult how traumatic you never are cut off you're never cut off when you have your prayer language you're never cut off I don't care how bad it feels you begin to pray and you build yourself up in your holy faith and in the love of God and so what am I saying to you as I close here the saturation is not necessarily emotional but it can be very emotional and refreshing but saturation has nothing to do ultimately with how emotional you feel it's that God's anointing from the kingdom is allowed into your spirit, fills your soul, begins to have expression through your body, and the kingdom is advanced no matter how you feel. Trust me, I've had times I have preached and spoke, and I felt abysmally horribly in the natural. And people come up to me, it's like they were just, they were, and they, they talk about what God did in their life. And, and this guy here felt like a, a piece of junk and crud. And that God will do that through you. You just obey him. You yield your spirit to him. You do what you're supposed to do in your ministry, in your life, in your relationships. And it doesn't matter how great you feel in that moment. God is using you because you've received an impartation and you're giving it away. And he loves that about you. He loves that about you. Would you stand? Father God, we thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that we would hold fast the pattern of sound words in faith and love, which is in Jesus. God, may everyone in this room, and you can even begin to lift your hands up right now and just praise him. Say, God, I want all that you have for me. I want the fullness of your spirit. Is there someone here who will admit I'm a dry sponge? Just make, just make your chair your altar right now. Just hold your hands up and say, I'm, like, I'm that dry sponge. 
and I want to be filled with the, with the waters of the kingdom. Lord, may my belly, may waters flow up out of my belly, Lord God. Li rivers of living water. And Lord, just come upon me your mantle of anointing. Now, Glory and I, uh, we're just going to take a few minutes. I feel led to do this. We're going to come to you and serve you. Gloria, let's just, uh, let's just go and begin to pray for some people. Uh, I'd like Nancy to assist. Nancy's an anointed sister. We're just going to be led to the spirit. I want you to keep your hands up. Come on now. If you meant it, keep them up. We're just going to come and pray for God to give you a cup of water from his kingdom right now. There's three of us. We can cover about 20 people. Keep those hands up. Lord, I pray for 